Entrepreneur W2. Entrepreneur has so much more upside. The great legends of being an entrepreneur could be 10, 100, a billion dollars. W2 employee, the certainty of getting to a million is much clearer. So if your goal is a million bucks and to, to chill on the mountainside looking over the, you know, what the sites like I am, it's a lot better to do it as an employee. But if you want to be a billionaire, then you got to be an entrepreneur. All right. So we are back with an amazing guest. This is actually somebody that I look up to a lot in a lot of different ways. I have Michael Zuber here. He has an amazing YouTube channel, has a large portfolio of real estate. You know, I'll let him introduce himself a little bit. I just appreciate you coming on, Michael, because I literally, you texted me this morning and you're like, looking forward to the podcast today. And I sent you a screenshot back. I'm like, I'm listening to your daily financial news on YouTube right now as you texted me that. So the only news I actually, you know, absorb is actually from stuff that you post. I don't actually listen to anything or watch anything else. So it's uh, it's good stuff. It's not negative. So that's why I like it. <laughs> yeah, I, I do my best to uh, synthesize 90 minutes of reading because I've been doing the same thing for 30 years. I get up early 530 ish. I read for about 90 minutes and uh, I've been doing that for 30 years, all about the economy, business, housing, interest rates, you know, all of those things. Now that I'm retired or been out for, for a long time, I have the ability to to put it together into a 15 minute show, go live at 7.30 a.m. Sunday through Thursday. And uh, it's a lot of fun. It's it's a lot of fun. So thank you for, for watching. Yeah, hundred percent. So for those that don't know your story, Michael, you know, maybe just give us a, you know, a couple minutes of, okay, where, where you started, you know, where you're at with, you know, this real estate, you know, empire that you've built, you know, talk about, you know, what, what does your team look like that supports you? And it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, employees, but it, whether it's contractors or other team members that do things for you, would love to, you know, get the audience kind of introduced to what that looks like. I've really had kind of two careers when you come at this kind of from building something meaningful. For 15 years, we built a real estate portfolio, which peaked out at about 187 units in Central Valley of California. Uh, I had to make some very early choices. In my career, I had a very stressful job. I would travel the world, not just the country. I would be in three different countries, often most weeks. And I knew the stock market wasn't for me. I knew at the time running a business wasn't for me. I was good at being an employee. I was good at getting commission checks and overachieving. And then what I did is I had, I watched my discretionary income. I grew that, meaning I saved money and I bought assets. We chose a market that was two and a half hours away from where we lived. I didn't know anyone. I didn't really have any information about it, but the numbers made sense. So the first thing I would say is live where you want, but invest where the numbers made sense. I wish I could tell you that early journey was easy. It was not. <laughs> Even when we only had a couple of houses, we ended up firing the first five property managers. First because again, five. Five, five. In the first five years, we had five different property managers. Might have oh been four gosh. years now that I think about it. That was because I knew that you know my wife would do the books. I would find deals and secure capital. And we could not interact with our tenants. Not, not only could we not, but we didn't want to. So we had to find deals that made sense and had enough margin to pay a property manager. And we've had now the same property manager for well over a decade. They've grown with us. Now with size, we have a single point of contact. We have one person that manages our portfolio. We have a set of contractors, both from GCs to handymen that we have approved on our list. And it's a lot more of a smooth process. I mean, it would probably embarrass most people to realize that Olivia and I spend about two hours a week or so on our portfolio. It is that tied in. We're doing a couple of exceptions. You know, we have a Friday call to kind of review things. But yeah, as long as we're not adding a ton, the portfolio does run relatively smoothly. So that's that's kind of step one of our career was was building that portfolio and really outsourcing the day to day management. Yeah, and we just secured capital, made money, and found great deals. That's that's all we did. So that was the I guess the the part 
one of the, I guess, business journey of, you know, investing. And then there's the, you know, now the content side and, and everything else that you're doing. Do you want to kind of touch on that? Um, how that, how that kind of started too? So it actually started, I don't know, if, I don't know if a lot of entrepreneurs have this. It certainly is my story. I retire financially free. I'm a type A individual. I am ecstatic for a couple of days because I no longer have to work for the paycheck. But Cody, I ended up getting depressed. I think a lot of type A individuals, if they don't have something to go to, might fall into that kind of depression camp. And that's where I was. And by the end of six weeks, maybe eight weeks, I was this close to getting a job because I was tired of being depressed. Ultimately, I decided I had a story to tell. I was an individual that read Rich Dad, Poor Dad and did something, right? Rich Dad, Poor Dad to me is a mindset. It opened the door, but it's not how to. So ultimately, it only took me about six weeks to write my first book, One Rental at a Time. It just flew out of me. But that success allowed me to go, you know what? I don't have to have a job. I don't have to work 40 hours. I don't have to put myself back into the pressure cooker to feel like I'm impactful. If I just share the one rental at a time story, focus, daily discipline, buy box, all of those things, a couple hours, five days a week, that's enough to feel like I'm contributing. I didn't know, Cody, that that would become uh, just this brand that's, you know, somebody offered me seven figures for you know, a couple of months ago. I had no idea. I did it because frankly, my goal day one is the same goal today is, I wanted to build something while I'm alive that outlived me 50 years after I'm dead. Mm -hmm. That's been my North star since day one. It's still my North star five years later. And I kind of measure everything against that. But yeah, it went from a book to a YouTube channel to courses to now an event. It's all by accident. Cody, I have no idea what I'm doing in this content business. Everything I do is live or unedited along the way. I realized that Thumbnails are kind of important. So I've outsourced that. I outsourced somebody to take the video and put it on a podcast. So along the way, I have found things I don't like to do and I pay people for. They're 1099s, not employees. Again, like, like building real estate. I know exactly what I'm good at, creating original content and networking with millionaires. And then I pay people to do the back end stuff. I love that because, you know, the, the interesting thing is, you know, from some some of the guests that I've talk to on the podcast, you know, it's like, uh, one of the last guys I was on with, you know, he has like 35 employees and like has this, you know, big operation of things going on. And it's like, it's so cool. Cause you know, in that conversation, we were talking about like doing the, you know, focusing on the things you love to do and then like having someone else or some other company handle all the stuff you don't want to do. And it's like, just another way of doing that same thing, just like you're talking about is like understanding like, what do you love to do? What do you want to be doing on a daily basis that brings you energy that brings you joy and finding how do you find, you know, people, you know, technology, resources, whatever outsourcing that can take all of those things that you don't want to do off your plate. And, you know, something that you said too, that I was just marinating on too, was when you quit uh, your job and then went to that place of, you know, being depressed, when my journey started in network marketing and, you know, that my entire goal when I was in high school is I was like, if I could just make a hundred grand a year was like, that's like the ultimate, like, that's it. You've made it. And when I got into the company I got into and I achieved that goal, I remember being 20 and being the most depressed I've ever been in my life. Cause I was like, what's the point? What does anything else matter? I'm like, this is, this is it. Like, it's kind of that feeling of like, well now what, you know, it's like, what am I supposed to do? And I think that's part of, I guess the growth journey of, you know, when, when you make money and, and especially when you start having a lot of free time too, it's like that free time becomes almost dangerous because you're just like, you're like, what's the purpose? What's the meaning? What is my meaning anymore? Because I had a purpose before and you have these things. And you know, that that hit hard with me just on like, life has to become more about money. And you know, someone listening right now, that's like, well, I'm making freaking 40 grand a year. And like, everything's about money. And it's like, it is until you have enough to like support 
kind of all the general things in life, you start to think about all the problems money doesn't solve. Like what's my purpose day to day? How are my, you know, how's my health and my relationships and all of the other things that money can't really do anything about. I've had that conversation with a lot of other successful people. And it's like, it's a common theme of like, you can't just stop. Like, otherwise you don't have a purpose and life becomes kind of sad after that point. And it's, you know, it's like, what do you, what are you going to do all day? It's like, eventually you could only go to so many nice steak dinners and or golf if people like to go. It's like, at some point, it's like, got to find something that's exciting to, to do. I want to I wanna touch on the, the real estate side, you know, you built up to 180 plus, <coughs> 180 plus units. I, I listened to your YouTube channel, obviously. And, you know, one of the, the guys you're on, I think his name's Brandon. Is he the guy on the East Coast that has a bunch of units and he self-manages them? So yeah, that's to... Matt the Lumberjack. I Matt the Lumberjack, doing. yes. Okay. Yes. So, you know, it's like, what what made you go that route where it's like someone, you know, like him that has a lot of units, but he's self-managing. What made you go this route of, I'm going to have a, a property manager? I guess the real answer is I couldn't have done it any other way. You know, Matt was lucky enough to invest in his backyard. He can drive to all of his units within 30 to 40 minutes. My market is two and a half hours away, one way. He has been in his market for well over a decade. So he knows the market. He knows the people. I chose a market where I knew no one. I had no relationships. And learning a market and learning a network at the same time is remarkably hard. You just got to know what you're good at. I was good at getting a software number, working as much as it took to kill it, getting that accelerator money, not you know living below my means and buying the next asset. So I knew what I was good at. And then if you were to talk to Matt and you know he were on together, Matt would tell you he didn't have any options. He didn't have the extra spread to pay a PM. He would have gone broke. You know, we were buying deals that, that had that spread included. So lot, lots yeah. of reasons. The biggest one is I didn't want to, and he does. He, he enjoys it. I could not imagine doing that. Yeah, <laughs> no, that... That makes sense. So I'm curious now, like what, it, what do you feel is like your biggest challenge that you're trying to work through now? It's like, obviously the real estate's kind of doing its thing a couple hours a week, just kind of checking in. And then there's the content and events and, you know, core stuff that you're doing. What do you, what do you see as your biggest challenge that you're trying to work through now? I would tell you the biggest challenge I get and I marinate on frequently is how do I take this message and go bigger, right? How do I impact more people? My North Star is impact. People reach out to me almost daily now and say, hey, let me help you with X, Y, and Z, right? They're making promises that I'm sure only half of them will come true and you know all of that. But I do wrestle with the idea of, hey, if I were to drop 10 grand here or five grand there or shoot 20 grand for this, could I reach more people? Now, when I say that, most people think I'm talking about more money. And yes, more money. I'd sell a few more books and all that other stuff. But that's not the goal, right? As long as I broke even, I would be okay with that. But I do wrestle with the idea. You know, it's kind of like the real estate thing. Fresno is really hard. Fresno, where I've been for 20 years, really hard. It's been really hard for four years. I think we've added 12, 13 doors in four or five years because it's just harder than it was before. I could have gone to other areas. I could go to Gary, Indiana or Huntsville, Alabama. I could do it again, but I don't want to. But, you know, it's just like, just because you can, should you? And I wrestle with that all the time, right? We're, we're you know, I touch, I help, I don't know, 10,000 people a day with a, hopefully a positive message and no bias. But what if it was 50,000? What if it was 70,000? I see what your your friend and, and mentor Pace does all the time. And it, it's amazing to watch. And I'm like, do I want that? He works really hard. He's He is all over the place. And I'm like, do I want that? Nah, I don't think I want to do that. But, you know, so I, I do wrestle with that whole, do you go faster, go harder? What I've told people is, I've gotten somewhere up the mountain of financial freedom. Mm -hmm. I chose to sit down, enjoy the view. I'm helping people come up. I do reserve the right Cody to stand up and climb higher. Mm -hmm. But at this point, I'm like, I'm okay here. So, you know, I don't, I don't want to be a billionaire. I don't need to be worth a hundred million bucks. Yeah. And you know, I already have more than I ever thought was possible. It's an interesting thing. And you know, I, I think it's good perspective for people listening too, because 
I think sometimes like I think about when I was in my early twenties, I was like, I want to be a billionaire. Like I, you know, it has to, it has to happen. Da, 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 da. And you know, it's like, I'm kind of at a stage now where like I was talking with my business coach literally yesterday and we're just talking about, you know, what I want to see over the next couple of years. And I'm like, I have everything that I want right now and then some and like more money at a certain point is just more money. Like, obviously, we want to make more money to be able to do more things with like family and support family and do, you know, cool things. And, you know, I'm, I'm starting this year a charity for animals here in Arizona. So it's like, it, you know, that it gives like resources to do more things, you know, and so it is important, but after you're able to comfortably pay all of your bills and you're able to comfortably, more than comfortably drive the cars you want to drive, go on the vacations you want to throughout the year, whenever you want to do it, more money doesn't really create any more happiness after that stage is kind of how I feel about it. And so I've been thinking more on that of like, okay, you know, what is the life that I want to design more so rather than just, I just want to build all the freaking businesses. And, you know, I'm still addicted to building stuff and like, it's super fun. And I figured out how to help companies that are kind of in that, you know, anywhere from a million, 3 million, 5 million that I feel pretty confident I could help most of those go to 10 million with just now doing it a few times with other companies of our own from scratch. And so it's like, it's just fun to do those things now, but it's not like out of, desperation of like, oh, gosh, we need the money from this. And, you know, it's and and I think what's interesting, too, and I'm curious on your thoughts on this, I think people think they need significantly more than they actually do to be able to do the things that they want to do in life. Like, people think you need to make a million a year to, to do, you know, to have a great life. Otherwise, it's like, oh, you're you suck kind of the attitude online and entrepreneurial world. <laughs> Yeah, and the it's really weird in the entrepreneurial world, which which again, I I think I'm a great employee, a decent investor, and a horrible entrepreneur. That's how that's my self reflection of myself. And you're right, I think there's a lot of people that go after a number, achieve it, and then the number just adds a zero. And that's dangerous in my opinion. It's 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 dangerous for a couple of reasons. Like let's talk about my case. I don't need the money. My brand is already spinning off 250 to 400 grand a year doing nothing. No ads, no team, nothing. Could I add three full-time employees and take it from 400 grand to 2 million? Probably, but do I want to add the extra risk? Do I want to I would have to change my life. No matter what I would do, I would have to mentor, train, hire, fire, do all of these other things. Plus that 2 million gross would probably be like, I don't know, a million net. And I already spin off 400 with a 90% margin. So is it really that different when I already, when my life is already paid for over here? I'm like, I play with all these things. I'm like, I'm not willing to give up my life. That's the answer why I'm not going to 2 million bucks is I don't want to give up an extra four hours a day. Why the hell would I want to do that? That's just when my brain gets all not it up. There's trade-offs. Like when you say yes to something, it means you're saying no to something else, you know, and it's like you have to put it through that filter. And that was something that, you know, and just for, for those that are listening in, you know, I, as you go through your journey as, you know, an entrepreneur and as, you know, building a business, uh, you know, no matter what the business is, like there's, there's, I think in the beginning stages, people are more used to having to say yes, because it's like, it's kind of scarce. And it's like, you know, whether they have a business, they take clients they don't want, because it's like, well, they're going to pay me and I need to keep my lights on. So I'm going to take them. So at the beginning stages, it's like, you're just kind of like trudging through and like saying yes to like, as much as you can just to make it. And then as you continue to grow and like build on the foundation, you're able to start saying no to more things. And some of those things being like opportunities, like, you know, uh, as Pace went into the multifamily space, you know, I was involved on one bigger deal with them. And then after, you know, we kind of separated on doing more because I'm like, I don't really, I don't know if I want to be in this space. Like this, the debt structures freak me out. I don't, it stresses me out. I don't sleep good thinking about these deals. Like the thing of like not like investing to get a return you don't need with money that you do need and that you could lose. It's like, why? Like why, you know, like that's, 
And, and that's just, I think, a risk tolerance thing. And like, I think that's what you talk about, too. It's like, well, it's like the things that are, I'm going to say no to. And it's like saying no to your peace. And it's saying no to that free time that you do have to do some of these other things you want to do. And saying no to the stress of having, you know, some of those different team members. And I wouldn't say when you're like, you know, you don't think of yourself as a good entrepreneur, like you're working a few hours a day and have, you know, created an ecosystem that's generating you know, $400,000 a year with a few, you're living, you know, the almost that, that four hour work week. Uh, I mean, between your real estate, technically you kind of are of that, you know, yeah. that, have, have you read that book, the four hour work? I have, week? I have, I read it years ago. Absolutely. It's, now, I read that when I was an employee, it was the dream. Yeah. <laughs> it was a great title. That's a great title, man. Four hour work week, sign me up. <laughs> <laughs> this is actually a great book. Like I've actually reread it a couple times, but I'm like, I don't want to work four hours a week because I just get bored. But it gives good perspective on on things like this. It's like, you know, no, you don't need to do it. You can give that to someone else. You can have a company do that. You can outsource it there. You can have, you know, these things. And that's what I think is the important thing is it's like designing sure. the life that you want and then having a business support the life that you want to actually build. And it's super, it's super interesting, you know, and I, and I, I feel like I've heard you talk to people about this too, where I think everyone thinks it needs to be a hundred grand a month or you don't live an amazing life. Like, I think it's more of like, okay, if you can get the, I mean, especially if it's like passive, like 20, 30 grand a month is like pretty gangster. And like above that, it's just like, you know, you're, <laughs> Yeah. I, I, so I, you know, I've been doing this for five years now, not having to work. And uh, if you can get to about 20 grand a month passive, you can, you can ball out pretty well in most of the country, but let's step back and talk. I, I really do believe you can be financially free on five or six grand. If you live in most of the country, right? Like the, the, the Midwest or, or, you know, the middle of the country. I really think full-time employees, there is a small business in them. There is a solopreneur. There is a hobby that they have that they love, especially if they're Gen X or, or baby boomers, something that they've been doing for 10, 15, 20 years that they can turn into a business. Now, they're not going to make millions of dollars, but they can make six figures. They can also, as you know, have tremendous tax savings, right? Let's just pretend it's Star Wars. You've liked Star Wars since the original movie came out in 76. You've got all this collectibles and blah, 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 and this, that, and the other. You could create a Star Wars channel. You can create, you know, this, that, the other around it. And next thing you know, you're buying your Star Wars things, you know, talk to your accountant, but they're tax write-offs, right? They're on your display. You're talking about them build a community around you. And I think today is the easiest time ever to become a solo entrepreneur. You don't have to go gangster with, you know, um, you know, all these the virtual assistants in Costa Rica or the Philippines. If you just spend a couple hours a week on living proof over years, you can build a following that really does become a business and it will supplement your income. And it's, it's pretty cool. Pretty amazing. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, adding on that too, is like, even the people that have a business and that they can just like share what they're doing in their business. That was kind of accidentally what me and Pace first started doing years ago was we would just like, people would ask us what we're doing. And then like, we started doing these like free conference calls, like literally this conference call line. And we're like, well, the, we'll just do a call and people ask questions and we'll talk about deals we're working on. And we started doing that and then people started sending us deals and we're like, oh, wow, like that's cool. We're making money from sharing this stuff with people. Yeah, we're getting deal flow. And, you know, so it's like, and then it turns it and then Pace, you know, started his community in sub two and, you know, obviously that's went really well. And, you know, it's like doing these different things. It's like anyone that has a business too already is, can start making content around it. You, if you have a business, especially a storefront of any kind, or, or a virtual storefront, and you're not creating content, your revenue could double or triple in a matter of months by creating the right content. And it doesn't have to be sexy. It doesn't have to be sizzle. It doesn't even have to be edited. You know this, Cody. I've done 12,000 videos. It's animal. One video has been edited. <laughs> the only one that got edited was Graham Stephan's video. Other than that, no edits. You don't have to be fancy or silly. Get over yourself, people. You know your thing better than anybody else. Create a top 10 FAQ, create a list of customer questions, create a list of the next inventory, the blowout sale, whatever you're doing, your money, your, your deals are triple. It's, it's pretty easy. It really is. And you know, it's, uh, there, there's, 
you know, one of the, so we bought, and I don't know if I've told you about this, but we bought a business last year called the plant guy. I can't remember if I told you about that. Very unique business. It's out of Florida, but it's, you know, luxury plants, basically not, you know, it's not, uh, you know, like stuff, like it's not that most of them aren't real plants. It's all like, um, you know, what there's like a welding shop making like these crazy animals and crazy designs. And then I'm doing such a terrible job or partner Matthew would hate me right now. His entire business is ran because of content. He just makes these beautiful Instagram videos and, and posts on Instagram. He has hundreds of thousands of people that are following him on there. You know, even with him, like he just loved what he did. And like his story was he just would years ago, he started with very small plant designs that he would put together and then it, you know, kind of grew and he started making content around it and people liked the content he made and would buy, you know, want to come and see his store. And as it's grown and like where we partnered with him last year, we're taking his business online because he has hundreds of thousands of followers, but wasn't yeah. selling online. He only would people oh my come goodness. to the store. And I'm like, dude, we should physical sell this location, stuff. huh? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> like we should sell online. You have a production facility and a warehouse to make this stuff. Like let's yeah. do this oh, thing. Wow. He's got some gorgeous. <laughs> I may have to look this guy up for my Vegas house. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, if you're if you're just keep you're ready to keep spending on that backyard, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put some of this inside the house. The house is massive. I'm yeah. Like, anyways, I digress. Sorry. <laughs> but you know, it's like a, a business like that, and it's like all. And I think the thing is too for for people that maybe consider you know scared to make content for their business because they're like, oh, like I don't even know you know who's going to be interested in this. There is a niche for everything. I was at this event in Dubai like six months ago. And it was a lot of infopreneurs that were there and I'm meeting these people and I'm just like, you do what? Like there, there was a guy there, his name is Mo and he created, so he became a nurse here in the States. Like he moved from uh, the Middle East, became a nurse. And then he was helping his friends that were having trouble passing their nursing exam with like how he studied for it. And so he made like a little program to like teach people how to best practices so they could pass their nursing exam on the first try instead of multiple tries. And so he's telling me the story and he's like, yeah, so I helped a few of them. Then other people were asking. So then I started like selling some of them. And then I was like, if there's this much demand of people needing this, he like turned it into a, a proper core, like an actual course with like just different like little eBooks and, you know, workbooks and all this different stuff. And now the freaking guy, like, he probably works, I mean, I don't know, maybe 10, 20 hours a week. And he's doing like a million and a half a month in sales selling to nurses that are just trying to pass their nursing exam with his, like, is like a $500 program selling thousands of them. I'm like, what the, fr like, you know, it's like, and it's just, and it's such a niche of like helping nurses that are, or people trying to become a nurse to pass their exam faster. And there's just all of these things that, and that's something that someone probably, you know, wouldn't think like, oh, like this is going to be a big money maker, but it's like, there's a market for so many different things. And like whatever business someone might be in, you know, there's a lot of other people in that business and a lot of communities don't even exist. And like in the real estate space, I feel like there's a lot of more, you know, there's a lot more influence, I guess, online of people doing things, but there's still room to break through because there's so many people wanting to to be in this space. Well, I think there's a couple of things, and, and Mo's a great example of this, and I think this is going to bear out over the next couple of years. I think 2020 to 2022 was kind of um, just helter-skelter, right? Anybody could blow up with any message. Get rich quick was very common a lot of pretenders. I think what we're going to see over the next couple of years is pretenders, doomers, crash bros, all those folks, they're going to disappear because it's just, there's no meat on the bone. But what Mo experienced, what the plant guy has, and what hopefully I have and you have is we really know what we're talking about. We have a undeniable stack of wins that we could point at. If you're a W-2 employee and you have this hobby or passion for a decade or more, you should have unbelievable confidence in yourself that there is a company. Again, it may be a one person shop, it's okay, but you may be able to create a small business that generates income that ultimately could replace your full-time income, but at a minimum gives you some money and something to work forward to when you retire. That's the magic. I've been lucky enough to be retired since 45, six or seven years ago. I've taken some amazing vacations, crazy expensive. 
And most of the people on those trips are 70, 80, and 90 years old. <laughs> they're rolling around they're in a very, wheelchair or something, yeah, huh? <laughs> they're very immobile. They're often very cranky because when you talk to them, they're very disappointed that they had to do all of this work and, the, and there's nothing left. Yeah. So if you build something in your passion, you have something to go to after you're done. Life is just so much better. I'm happier today, you know, than I was six or seven years ago. And I'm only working up a couple hours a day, but I get notes every day. Hey, you're helping me. You changed my life, blah, blah, blah. Hey, I'm ready to show up for tomorrow. So I think being a solopreneur is, it's not, it's not talked about enough. It's okay to be a solopreneur. It's okay to make 200 grand a year, 80% profit. It's okay. It's do what you love. It is. It is. And, and, and that's where, you know, I, I was excited to have you on too. Is it's like talking about, you know, it's like that other side of like seeing, okay, like there are pros and cons on both sides. It's like, okay, pros scale more money, but more problems for, for sure. For <laughs> sure. You know, it's like, I got and less time. Yeah. Less and less time. time. That's definitely, you know, I, that's where I'm, I'm working on my ascension over the next couple of years, building the right team to incentivize and, you know, give out the right incentives to, kind of, you know, make, make my, I don't want to say departure. Cause like, gosh, I'm, 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 I'm not 30 yet. So I'm like, what the freak am I going to do all, all <laughs> yeah, day? Exactly. You, Dude, you got a couple of decades ahead of you, man. Come on. What's up? <laughs> yeah. So it's like, you know, it's just figuring, like figuring out what that ideal designed life is. And it's like choosing that, you know, solo preneur path of like, okay, like you said, it's like making that high margin, you know, maybe more time. But if it's in your regard with like the content, it's like high margin. And it's, you know, the scale of just the digital content is already there. You don't have to show up for it. It's already created. And so yep. that's a, there's a big opportunity in it. Um, and so, so that's kind of, you know, something that people consider and, you know, the other side of, you know, yeah, make more, but, you know, I, I kind of look at it for me as like, I can fit in this window of time of just like hustle and just stack as much money as absolute possible and going into, you know, for me, I, I think I want to just lend money on people's deals. Like I started doing that. I know I'm like going on a tangent now, but I've, I've found, and maybe it's because of Arizona is just, I've gotten bored and I can't really buy many rentals here because it's just like they don't make sense right now. It's like <laughs> they don't make I don't sense. Know, yeah. It sucks, but it is what it is. And I'm kind of in that same, you know, I don't want to say same because I have I have nearly as many properties as you, but in that place of like, well, what should I put eighty thousand dollars in a deal that's going to cash flow two hundred dollars a month? Like it doesn't really pencil great, you know. It's like have to go to a new market, learn a new market, build all new relationships. So it's like going, going with that, you know, I've started, uh, you know, over the last year now I've been lending, you know, all the money that I would have normally just been putting into deals. I'm just lending on, you know, friends, fix and flips and, and things. And I'm like, this is pretty nice. Like this is actually pretty passive because my assistant's the one that, you know, she'll, she'll do the paperwork, you know, handles it with them, gets the, gets the wire out, you know, make sure the ACH, you know, collects the payments monthly. And I'm like, this is actually pretty passive. You know, because man, actually managing and you know your own properties is not exactly passive, but you know, I think lending is about as close as it gets to passive. <laughs> yes, yeah, lending in the real estate world, lending is is close enough to passive, just up until you need to foreclose. Yeah, it's yeah, <laughs> yeah, and that's the thing that I that I worry about. But you know, it's it's I, and and I guess I'm just curious. Have you, have you considered doing, you know, that with any of your portfolio, like anything that you sell and like cash sitting on the side, do you ever lend on, on deals, um, with other investors? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, if I can go get 10% interest on my money, instead of it just sitting there making four relatively risk-free on a deal that I believe in with a person I believe in. Yeah, I've, I've certainly done that. Yes. That, and that's, you know, that's something I've definitely been more interested and i'm in that same boat like i've had some other people like will you lend on the deal and i'm like that's your second flip ever uh no no th i'm sorry no, <laughs> it no doesn't chance. even if no you chance. offered me 25 percent interest i am not lending on that deal no thank you yeah i'm not i'm not your i'm not your boy <laughs> yeah so, i have like three buddies that have been you know flipping for five to eight years in three different markets and they're just steady eddie just great operators yeah. and it's like yep that's that's it <laughs> Yep. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. You get a Rolodex of a couple of people. You don't need many, Yeah. but you still got to watch them, you know, to make sure they don't get over their skis. But yeah, 
that's not a bad strategy, especially in the market we're in today, right? High prices, high rates. Yeah. And and just like you said, we could go somewhere else. We just don't want to. It's a whole nother can. It's of just worms. another thing to figure out. It's like now you got to find the good property yeah. manager again, which is like I, you know, the the passing of going through that. So our our journey of that was I, you know, I was all gung ho when we were first get you know building our portfolio, and I'm like, we're gonna have our own in house property management. And so it was like me and, you know, Pace's wife, Laura, doing it. And I was just like, this is the worst thing ever. I hate this. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it is absolutely is the, one of the worst jobs yeah, it, in the real estate game. Being it's at the end. brain damage. And so, you know, but getting out of that. And then so I think about like having to go through that process of shopping property managers and then, you know, figuring out what zip codes to, you know, that are good ones and the contractors that are good and bad and all that. It's just like, eh, it's not. Not not that appealing <laughs> not anymore. So I totally get that. <laughs> <laughs> so not doing that. Definitely. Again. So I guess, you know, I'd love to, you know, love to have you kind of share with with people that are listening, Michael, on whether somebody's they they are that solopreneur stage that they want to, you know, maybe build build upon that. Or maybe they're maybe they're listening because there are people that, you know, message me that are listening to the podcast that they're still working a W two job right now and they're like doing a little bit of a side hustle on the side, making like a thousand bucks a month, but they, you know, their job pays them six. So they can't, you know, they they're building their way up. You know, what would you say are some of the the best steps for those people that are maybe in the W two transitioning to solopreneur and then maybe beyond, or if they stay there because that's what you know makes them super happy? What would you say the the best steps that you would suggest to someone in that stage? So first and foremost, if I was talking to W two employees, which really is my focus, those are the people I'm trying to reach with my content because I want them to know what the future could hold if they just execute. Right. There's a lot of folks that will sell sizzle and dreams and all of this hocus pocus and say, quit your job and, you know, do all these things. I'm like, no, let's build something on the side, you know, one step at a time, one video at a time, one post at a time, wherever you're trying to get out there and realize that in five to 10 years, you're going to have something. As long as it's on your passion and your hobby and you're not faking it, if you're faking it, they're going to find out. But if your hobby is, you know, going back to Star Wars, not even Star Wars, it's Darth Vader. Like, you know, everything about Darth Vader. There is a community out there that that's their thing. Go serve that community in an authentic fashion. And over time, it will grow. And I don't believe you need a very big community. I think if you had a channel with 4,000 subs, that's real income and, and real other things. Cause you could do, you can monetize so many different other ways. One of the things that's become again, total accident. I did a thousand videos on my channel before I was monetized. Most people give up after 10. I did a thousand. When you think about all the ways that money has spit off because of that YouTube channel, it, it'll blow your mind. Written two books, both are on audible, different income streams. We've done courses. I have six or seven different paid courses from 50 bucks to a thousand bucks. That's hundreds of thousands of dollars. I have or at swag. I have referrals to different things. And, you know, as long as you stay authentic, you, you, you recommend what you believe in and what you use by accident with no team, my or at LLC, which is where all the education is, 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 you know, over 400 grand a year. It's, it's all the, and again, it took time, right? I did yeah. a chart one time for Think Media where it showed my income by year. And the first year was like 800 bucks or something. The next year was like 20 grand. Then it was like, I think it jumped to like 180 and then three something. And then it's it's gone up from there. So just like everything in life, it takes time. Yeah. Our real estate portfolio took 15 years. Yeah. YouTube channel is almost six years old. Most people want it yesterday. Yep. That's just not how the system works. No. If you give me five years, you give me 10 years of consistent execution, you'd be shocked at what could happen. It's so true, you know, and 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 so I, I was talking to, I have, you know, a couple of younger cousins that, you know, live in Texas and they were in for the holidays and, you know, I took them for a drive in the Lambo and they were like, oh my God, you know, they're all excited yeah. and stuff. And it's, and that's, that's the actual joy that comes from that car is like, you know, experience and you know, trying to mentor people a little bit. I was talking to one of my cousins and just, you know, he's just like, how long did this, you know, like, how long does this take and whatever. And so we were just talking about it and it's like, 
you know, me and Pace partnered almost five years ago. And it's like, you know, I was doing well. I was making six figures before then, but, you know, coming together, it's like, you know, to getting into, you know, earning seven plus, you know, figures a year and like the portfolio and everything that's been built. It's like, I could technically stop working now and just never work again. I would probably shoot myself just because I'd be depressed. Yeah, you'd be depressed. You'd be depressed. I, I've been there. It's not a good place to be. Don't go there. Bad, yeah, bad, bad, it's bad. not a good place to be. But, you know, it's like I think people it's like that saying it's like, you know, people underestimate or they overestimate what they can do in a year, but underestimate what they could do in 10. I would even say five, you know, like you like you said, it's really in five consistent years of working. And I had a mentor. Um, do you know who Darren Hardy is? Yeah, of course. Something he said that I was just like, I'm just going to do that. If I could just commit to that, then like that's, you know, I, I'm just going to do that. He, and he and the commitment was, if you're going to start, you know, this new business venture, don't even start unless you're going to give it four years. If you're not going to give this thing four years, don't even start. Quit now. Don't even start. And that was that was the one commitment I made starting. I'm like, I'm just going to at least just freaking grind it out for four years. And he, and in the, in this like uh speech, he was talking, he's like, and in four years, if you haven't progressed, quit, give up. Fine. Sure. Yeah. Full, full blessing. Get out, <laughs> get out. It's not working out. And you know, so it's cause you can start getting momentum within a couple of years. And then by the time you're at year four and five, it's like, all right, like, I'm glad I stuck it out. And I, you know, made that mm -hmm. commitment. But I think so many people are, you know, they're just, so they feel like it's so far away, but it's really yeah. just making a commitment and then sticking to it and, and grinding it out, you know, over, over those, you know, few years of time. And it's like, I'm, yeah, yeah, go ahead. I'm sure you know who Andy Frisella and, and Ed Milet are. Yeah. You, you know, those, those names, right? I heard, I heard them talk. This was on Ed Milet's show. I think it was three or four days ago. They talked about entrepreneurs. And these are numbers that I think people need to hear. I've never heard them before. Maybe they existed, but they're not in my world. Ed Milet said about 8% of the population is destined, like wired to be entrepreneurs, which of course I then translate that. Great. There's 92% of people like me. We're employees, right? Good employees. But the next thing that Ed said was like eye opening to me. He said only 1% of the entrepreneurs will become millionaires. And if you think about that, that's less than one in a thousand people will be entrepreneurs and successful. This is why I go back to serving employees. If we can talk to W2 employees and just get us to open our eyes a little bit about doing, like if you build something with a couple of posts a week for five years, you will have an amazing community and additional side hustle income. What bothers me is everybody wants it tomorrow. I'm sorry, guys, you're not all Kylie Jenner. And become billionaires because of Instagram. I'm yeah. sorry, just stop it. Yeah. But if you give it five years, and oh, by the way, keep doing your day job, this thing on the side should be something you would do for free. If you want to geek out with Star Wars, just to stay with stay with the example, you should be able to do that and have fun. Mm -hmm. And then other people will come around you because you'll see you're authentic. And there is stuff there. And then if you talk to an accountant while you're working, you can do some write-offs mm -hmm. and all this other stuff above the line, below the line. It's a totally different tax structure. There's just so much upside to taking a passion and starting something. There, there really is. And, and so this is, and, and I don't know how much a fan you are or not are, because I know you, you, sometimes you'll talk about certain things and, you know, I'm not sure where you're at with him, but, you know, Dave Ramsey, for you know, this so with with his stuff, I've actually been enjoying listening to his podcast and stuff more recently. And I don't know why. I don't know what that's about, but I am. And it's like he has a lot of interesting stuff on entree leadership, actually. I feel like dirty saying that almost because like, like <laughs> I'm a Dave Ramsey fan. Yeah, you, like you gotta go to confession me, like they all hate him. And I'm like, he has some good principles that I actually like. <laughs> so so let me say this. I think Dave Ramsey has helped more people get out of financial debt than any other human being on the planet. And he deserves credit for that. In my opinion, he has some extremely bad examples of real estate, but let's, rem let's remember Dave Ramsey's story. Dave Ramsey was a flipper. 
He had a million dollars in equity back when a million bucks was real money. And he lost it all because he had short-term 90-day 90 90 debt. I'm sorry, but if you're flipping homes with 90-day debt, you deserve to go broke. And he has never let that go. And, and I agree on that. And so that's, that's definitely one of the points where I'm like, I do not align with his real estate advice because I have lots of debt in real estate but <laughs> on purpose. And so, you know, the, the thing that he talks about, though, that, you know, is interesting and aligns with, you know, the, uh, your, your statement on, you know, W2, they did their study of like 10,000 millionaires and like the careers, like the most common careers millionaires were in. And, and I'm going to, there's, I'm positive on a few of these. One of them, I'm not so much, but I know the first one he said was engineers was the first one. He's like, engineers was the most common industry or career that popped up. Engineer, teacher, which is crazy because teacher. teachers. Yeah. I want, that's the one that people that should hit home. Yeah. Yeah. Teachers, teachers. was another number one. Two. Yeah. And, and then CPAs was another one mm -hmm. that was those, I know those three were in there and I couldn't remember if number four was sales professionals or attorneys, but I think it was one of those. What, two. Yeah, they were both. Yeah. But again, let's talk about teachers. Mm -hmm. Most of us would recognize of that list you just gave teachers are the lowest paid. That's a fair, unfortunate, but fair statement. I was shocked to hear that. I was like, teachers, seriously, like they're on the, they were on the list. They're like number two, I think at the, at the list. And again, it's really because they live below their means. They take the discretionary income, they buy assets and they hold. They're not traders. They hold for decades. And that's the key to getting wealthy. The key to getting wealthy, like Grant Cardone says, right, is you have to have discretionary income so you could buy some assets and those assets produce cash flow and live off the cash flow. Mm -hmm. Another way is, you know, teachers live below their means, they save, they invest, and they just keep doing that. So getting wealthy is an easy process, but it takes a decade. And how many people don't want to wait a, a year, let alone wait a decade? No, it's, it's so hard and, you know, trying to talk to, and it's like, you know, events and different things that I'm at. And I like, try to like talk through that plan with certain people and they're like, you know, get upset. Like I remember this guy and it's really funny. So there's a mastermind like a year and a half ago with a guy who's from Florida. I feel so bad. I forget his name, but I remember there was a guy from Florida. He was a pharmacist, came to the mastermind and he was there and he was on a hot seat. And we were talking through his business and he's like, you know, I'm going to quit my job and I'm going to go all in on the real estate business and, you know, wholesaling and flipping and da, 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 da. And I told him, I was like, I think that's a really terrible idea. He made like almost 200 grand a year as like a manager, far, farm managing pharmacist at a company. And I'm like, dude, like you're almost making 200 grand a year. I'm like, and so I was like breaking it down. I'm like, so when you're seeing these other wholesalers saying that they're bringing in a hundred grand a month. Their nets probably, if they're a good operator, 30,000, 40,000, maybe, maybe if they're a good operator. Yeah. Gross and, first net, baby. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like trying to talk through that. So I'm like, and that's doing a hundred grand a month and revenue consistently in a wholesale business is, is that's, you know, it's an accomplishment to do. And so like, I was trying to talk through that with him and I'm like, you're already almost at 200,000 a year. So I'm like, you know, so he, he, I could tell he was upset. Didn't like the advice. Um, Quit his job. He burst his bubble, but oh, he did quit. He ended up quitting. So this is so this is the story. Wow. He quit his job, and like my advice was, I was like, "Hey, see if you can negotiate, renegotiate your agreement with them to be, you know, a little working maybe less, like because he, he's been there part for time. years, you know, part time or something." I'm like, "At least keep it part time, you know, something." And so he quit. It's probably nine months later, he came to another mastermind, and he was just a returning guest, and he came up to me and he's like, "Cody," he's like. I wanted to say, you know, s screw you. So he said something else, not screw you, but, you know, F you when you told me that in my head when, you know, I was at that last event and he's like, I quit my job. And so he like tells me the story. He's like, I quit after a couple months. I was really floundering, trying to get traction going in the business. I was able to go back and, you know, I, I renegotiated and I actually was able to get them to bring me on as a contractor so I could pick the days that I wanted to work. And now, you know, I was able to still make money and not be tied down to, you know, every single day of the week there. And he's like, now I'm, you know, I've got, I got a couple of flips going and I'm able to manage those cause I don't, I'm not stuck at work. And I'm like, yes, like that's, that's it. Like you don't need to need to quit. Cause like it's, I think people underestimate how hard it is to net 100 to 200,000 a year as a business owner. 
Like that's no, I, I totally agree. It, it bothers me to no end. That's why I appreciated what Ed uh, had to say is, you know, 8% are wired that way and only 1% of that eight. So you got to put those numbers together. You know, mm -hmm. It's less than one in a thousand mm -hmm. are successful. If successful is a million bucks a year. <laughs> yeah. It's okay to be an employee folks. You are, this is what I will admit. And let me tell you if you tell me if you agree or disagree. Entrepreneur W2. Entrepreneur has so much more upside. The great legends of being an entrepreneur could be 10, a hundred, a billion dollars. The peak of the mountain is higher. W2 employee, the certainty of getting to a million is much clearer. It's you, there will be more of these that get to a million. So if your goal is a million bucks and to, to chill on the mountainside, looking over the, you know, what the sites like I am, it's a lot better to do it as an employee. But if you want to be a billionaire, then you got to be an entrepreneur. I'll give you that much. It really is. It's so true. And in my mindset around that on like the W2 versus entrepreneur has flipped. So from like 18, because I, I, I had this chip on my shoulder. I was like, because I wasn't going to go to college. I was like, I'm going to be an entrepreneur. I'm, you know, started a network marketing. Everyone talked crap to me. So I had this chip of like, screw you, everyone that works a job, like that sucked. Nah. Ah, you know, it's like, you, you know, whatever. <laughs> you right? loser. Yeah. Yeah. You're working like, for the man. Yeah. That was my mindset till I was probably like 22 or 23, you know, because that's when I actually started hiring team members. And, you know, for the first time when my, in my real estate agent business and, you know, my, my mindset started shifting because I started recognizing there's like really talented people that don't want to be entrepreneurs, but want to be great team members that are plugging into a great organization. Mm -hmm. And so that's really helped me grow in my leadership and understanding of, uh, of that. And actually the compassion and empathy and the actual understanding of most people should not be an entrepreneur. I'm like, most people should not get, you know, that should be a t-shirt. Yeah. <laughs> Most people should not be entrepreneurs. Cause again, on social media specifically, entrepreneurship, burn the bridges, go all in. That's sells. That gets clicks. That gets, I hate my job. Screw the man, blah. But you know what? You want to get rich. Look at your job as a tool. You're what every day you're closer to being done. Every day you're closer to walking in and giving the middle finger to the boss when you're ready. As opposed, cause I don't know about you, but I've read several stats that say, most entrepreneurs fail five times before their sixth business hits. Can you really quit your job as a pharmacist and fail five times and not go bankrupt? I mean, it's just, it, it, we have to celebrate. We have to make W2 employees understand it's okay to have a job. It's okay to build something slow on the side. That's what I, that's what I'm trying to show with one rental at a time. One of the reasons I haven't thrown a hundred grand at, marketing and all of this is because I see the impact of showing folks, Hey, just keep showing up, just show up every day, show up every day and, and to see what we can build. Right. Who would have guessed I, I'm a hosting an event in Vegas in like two weeks with 300 paying guests. I would have never guessed that two years ago, but they're all coming to celebrate 50,000 subs two-day event. It's it's wild to think what you can build when you're authentic, you look to help people and it grows from there. It's 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 wild to think about. So it's amazing. And and I appreciate that <clears throat> that message so much, you know, of like it's okay for people to do that, you know, and, and okay to be in that. And and I look at that with like, you know, all the employees that, you know, we have between the companies that we have. And it's like, it's so cool to see, you know, what people are, are doing. And it's like, we have multiple employees at our companies that like they're buying rentals, not fast, but like they're buying a rental. And then they've done, you know, like our videographer did, you know, like 10 wholesale deals over the last like 18 months. And it's like, it's, it's like, dude, that's freaking, it's amazing, you know? And, you know, there's a couple people that have like bought a property, you know, have, you know, an Airbnb and it's like, you know, them and like their wife and, you know, they co-manage it together. And it's like, it's so cool seeing, you know, that. And it's like, that's where the wealth does get built. And I think that's where people have to, um, and, and I think, I think the distinction too, for the, the W2 people that are unhappy is if you hate what you do with the people you do it with, sure. Quit, go work somewhere else like that. You shouldn't, you, sh you shouldn't hate your life and what you're doing. But you know, if you, if you like the work you do, like find a good place to do it at. And it's like, 
it's not it's not bad i would i would argue cody you know i've got two decades on you yes almost three decades most people that say they hate their job it's a mindset thing they feel trapped or they feel like they don't have options but if you flip the mindset to this is a vehicle to get me to financial freedom you really do start to show up to the job just knowing i'm one day closer to being done one day closer one day closer yeah reframing it reframing it i think is a big part of it you know it's uh I, I think there's, you know, environment that you're in can definitely negatively affect it, but it's like, you get to be the one that, you know, it's like, to, like life is going to happen to you. You get to choose how you're going to react or respond to, to the life that's, you know, occurring and, you know, choosing how you're going to frame the way you think about it. Yeah. I think I saw something the other day that I think is a statement we should just all understand. Most Americans are fat, unhealthy, and have no emergency funds. Right? They're not financially secure. If that's the case, then we probably shouldn't do what most people do. Just be different. Do, do what's abnormal. And um, the other thing I would tell you that I've, I've come to learn in life is if you want to grow, you need to fire your friends. Most of you that are unhappy or not where you want to be, I could look at the five people you're around most and they suck. They're just doomers, losers. They're holding you back. They take your dreams and vision and they crush them. You need to fire those idiots and go get some new ones. Go get in new rooms. Go get, a, go get in around people that are positive and doing some work. You want to be a millionaire? Go get around five millionaires. You want to be in the housing business? Go get around those. Stop. Your friends are not helping you. They suck. Especially if you're 18 to 25, your friends really suck. That's so true. My, you know, and that, uh, that was my separation time of like when I was 17, 18, I got into network marketing and, you know, I didn't relate with any of my friends anymore. It felt like a black sheep. Cause I'm like, I don't have anything in alignment anymore. And like all my friends were now at that time, then like 25 to 35. Cause like that was the age group of, you know, some people doing things. And I think that's definitely a, a big key too, for people's like, you gotta, you know, audit who you're spending your time with. And, you know, if it's not, people that are bringing you up and that you can talk about things or, or, you know, I think one of the worst things is like when you, when you're uncomfortable to talk about the things you're excited about, because you feel like it's going to make them feel bad about themselves. It's like, man, like we can't be excited. You know, like my, one of my good friends, Dylan, he, uh, he's someone I lend to, he bought a Lamborghini, uh, like a couple months ago. And I'm like, Lam we're Lambros now. And like, you know, we'll cruise around. It's a good time. But you know, he, he's like, I mean, for him, it's some family. And like, this is also true to this as well Is like, you have to sometimes like separate how much time you're talking to certain family if it's toxic. But you know, he had a certain family member that he's like, I need to literally like that family members coming to visit. Can I leave my Lamborghini at your house? Cause I don't want to have the toxic negative energy about the car <laughs> how how bad is that <laughs> uh, of course you said yeah you can leave it right over yeah. here I'll just I have two. <laughs> but it's like you know that's that's yeah, you know it's like I something it. that people I, have to I audit like that we're like who are you allowing to to influence and like put put things in your head you know in a negative way or or discouraging way you know yeah the life is you know if you want to make a difference you want to there's another saying i really believe in you're going to be alive in 10 years. Act like it. Invest like it. If you don't change, why do you think anything's going to change today? You're going to be older, more out of shape, fatter, worse. You're going to be in worse financial shape unless you do something different. Make the decision one day or day one. So true. That, that, uh, that fatter comment hits, hits home. I, I, I tw like once I got past 27, I'm like, yo, my metabolism is not the same. I cannot eat. Dude, wait till you're 50 mother. Dude, I, 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 I'm like, I have a trainer, you know, I'm in the gym five <laughs> days a week and I'm like, it's like, I have to work twice as hard for the same result <laughs> I used to in my early twenties. And I'm like, this is ridiculous. Oh, I'm I do terrified. not feel bad. For I'm you. terrified. You know, 40, 50. I'm like, what's going to happen? <laughs> Oh, I, I will tell you what happens. You wake up and everything hurts. That's what happens. <laughs> That's great. Well, Michael, I, you know, I, I appreciate you, you coming on. What would you say as, you know, a couple final words of encouragement for those, you know, whether they're in that stage of W2, going to solopreneur, solopreneur, building a business beyond themselves, 
what what would you uh what would you say to those those folks that are just grinding through it and they're you know there's people i'm sure that are just like gosh this is so hard and like is it gonna am i gonna figure this out is it worth it i would tell everyone the first five years suck for everyone you don't get the compounding you don't learn the lessons uh, you don't get the network. You don't get the compounding effect until after year five. After year five, it gets better. And by year 10, it's amazing. So the first thing I want to tell people is it is worth it. If you are truly working and you're truly grinding every day, it will get better and it will get amazing. Next, I want people to know and believe it's possible. There are too many people that have already given up and they haven't even tried. And then lastly, Block negativity. These devices are tools for success or tools for failure. And if you are somebody that looks at your social media feed and get depressed, jealous, scared, you are following the wrong people. If you were to look at my feed, it's all positive. It's all this. If any negativity comes in, I block that creator and I never see it again. Your social media is a reflection of what you want to see. Stop blaming the companies. It's your feed. You own it. Block these people. That's what I would say. I love it. Thank you so much, Michael. Appreciate you coming on. And with the last thing, and we'll put it in the uh, description below on YouTube and in the podcast notes, where do you want people to go to find you and learn more about what you're doing? I've done very few things right as an entrepreneur, but one of them is one rental at a time. Website, brand, YouTube, books, everything is one rental at a time. So I got that right. I love it. All right. Thank you, Michael.